from him who was and who is and who is to come, Christ the Lord. Amen. Our text is that first verse from the Gospel, John 17, where Jesus prayed, I ask for those who believe in me through their word. That will be our text. A man fell into a pit, a deep and dangerous gaping hollow in the ground. He realized there was no way that he could get out on his own. He was going to need help. And he panics, and he frets, he screams, he cries out, and nobody comes. Nobody hears him. Hours pass, his hopes fade, until finally a distant passerby hears this faint yelling and makes his way toward this hole in the ground. Finally, he stands over the mouth of this hole, he looks down, he sees a man in trouble below. Now that person, that passerby, is the subject of of an ageless question, and that question is, who is my neighbor? See, standing at the mouth of this pit is somebody you know. That person, that passerby, is you. You're the neighbor, you're the stranger, you are the one who believes in Jesus because of the apostle's word. So the question then becomes, what are you going to do? Now the easy answer would be to say, well, I would help him out, but I'm not so sure about that. I mean, the safe thing to do would for me to say that, yes, of course you'd help him out, and amen, the sermon's over. That wouldn't make a very good sermon. So, I'm not sure I would do that, because I can't count how many people stranded on the side of the road I've passed by. So maybe whether or not you help that person largely depends on the kind of person you are. And that's what we're going to explore for just a few moments this morning. So perhaps you are a caring, sensitive, intuitive person, and you come across this person that's falling this giant gaping hole. And you do what comes naturally to you because your gift is compassion. So you kneel at the mouth of this hole, you look down eye to eye, and you say to him, I feel for you down there. And you pray for him because that's what you know to do. You pray for them, you encourage them a little bit, but you can't figure out engineering science. There's no cell phone reception anywhere, so you make your way. Does that make you a bad person? Or perhaps you are a calm and partial logical person and you stumble across this hole with a man inside and your gift is analysis. So you do what comes naturally to you. You survey the area, you figure out the calculations and the probabilities and you look down to this hole, you say, I can understand how someone would fall into a giant gaping hole like this. But you're late for an appointment and you're never late. So off you go to your appointment. Does that make you a bad person? Or perhaps you are a naturally curious, playful, carefree person, and you stumble across this man who had fallen in this giant gaping hole. Your gift is inquisitiveness, and so you do what comes naturally to you. You look down at this hole, you say, how'd you manage to fall in this giant gaping hole? But then you ask him about his wife, his kids, his job, his career, life, the tigers, how they can't hit anything. You ask all kinds of questions. You take his mind off of his problems for a bit. That's what you're good at. That's what you do. So your job is done and off you go. Does that make you a bad person? Or perhaps you're a bit of a pessimist. Your life is one constant state of upheaval, so it comes as no surprise to you because trouble follows you wherever you go that you of all people are the one that stumbles across this man who had fallen into this giant gaping hole. Your gift is realism, and so you look down into this hole, you say, brother, you ain't seen nothing yet until you've seen the abyss that I've fallen into. And then you talk about your troubles and your struggles and your pains and your hurts, and you help him realize that he doesn't have it as bad as he thinks he does down there at the bottom of the hole. And you've made him feel better, at least you think you did, and so you think your job is done and off you go. Does that make you a bad person? Yes, but that's beside the point and doesn't work for this story, but let's move on. Imagine 
that you are a fan of TV evangelists and you stumble across this man in the hole. So you do what comes naturally to you. You look down and you say, hey, brother, I have a tube of holy water from the Jordan River and for $1,000, I can give this to you and make your pit disappear. <laughs> and then you move on because your job is done. But most likely, you are a Missouri Synod Lutheran. And you stumble across this man in the hole. So you do what comes naturally to you. You look down and you say, you deserve this pit, you poor miserable sinner. <laughs> and you move on your way. Well, whatever the case, whoever you are, chances are you have indeed been to that mouth of that gaping hole with somebody inside. And perhaps you didn't even notice they were there. Perhaps you stopped. Perhaps you did what you could. Maybe you gave your all. Maybe you reached inside to try and pull them out. You sacrificed time and energy and resources only to realize that the person at the bottom of this hole really doesn't seem to want to come out anyway. People are falling down everywhere. They may not be in some deep, dangerous hole in the ground. They may not be beaten up and left for dead at the side of some unsavory road somewhere. But they are, in fact, everywhere. And maybe you stop. Or maybe you pass them by. Maybe we're stingy with our gifts. Or maybe you're generous to a fault. Maybe we stand in the place of Jesus in moments like that. Or moment, maybe we stand in the way of Jesus in moments like that. But we try, and my prayer is, is that we don't stop stopping along the way. But I think lost in this whole familiar story is the way that this is really supposed to end. A man falls into a pit, a deep and dangerous gaping hollow in the ground. He realizes he can't get himself out. He needs help, and so he frets, and he panics, and he cries, and he screams, but nobody hears him. I mean, really hears him. And nobody comes. I mean, really comes. I mean, people stop, and they pray, and they, they try to figure a way out, but in the end, can't or won't. Finally, a man hears him those distant cries, and he comes ever closer, and he stands at the gaping hollow, and he looks down, and he sees a man below in trouble. Now, the man standing there is the answer to an ageless question. It's somebody you know. His name is Jesus, and he reaches down, and he lifts him out from his fear, his heartache, his pain, his isolation, his despair, and he sets him free. For as much as we would like to think that the burden of man's salvation is on our shoulders, it's not. It's not on our shoulders. God saves. You don't. And that's probably the greatest news the world has ever known, that God is God and you are not. But he's given us a mission in this world to not only love him, our Lord, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but to love our neighbors just like that, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that's why Jesus, in these hours before his death, in that garden of Gethsemane, in this great high priestly prayer, begins this section by praying for those who believe in him through the word of God's people. I ask for those who believe in me through their word, and that's everybody around you. Because the length to which and the depth of which God demonstrated his love in giving Jesus for us, for you, is the same love that he gave for that man in the bottom of that hole, crying out, screaming, angry, afraid, isolated, alone. That's our neighbor. So what are you going to do? Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.